the difference between the pKa of a proton and its acidity influences the relative concentrations of associated and dissociated forms in solution. What do I mean by that? Well, check out the things I've boxed in blue on this slide. pKa is equal to pH minus the log of A minus over HA. Or in other words, pKa minus pH equals the negative log of A minus over HA. This is the henderson hasselbalch equation, and it tells us that the larger the difference between pH and pKa, the more associated or dissociated form we'll have around. And I invite you to think about this equation in more detail on your own, especially in terms of if the difference is positive or negative, what, is the, what effect does that have on the ratio of associated to dissociated forms? Will it be greater or less than one? I won't say too much about that because I prefer to focus on the applications of pKa for this particular lecture. Notice on the basis of our derivation here that the larger a Ka value is, the smaller its pKa will be because of the negative sign. So when we take the log, that puts everything on a logarithmic scale, and when we multiply it by negative 1, we essentially invert the scale so that more acidic molecules have lower pKa's. Keep that in mind as we move forward, especially as I provide some examples of pKa on the next slide. What you'll realize if you take a look at a table of pKa's is that the range that they span is absolutely epic in proportions. So the lowest pKa's, the lowest pKa's typically used in a practical setting organic chemistry are around negative 7 to negative 10, HCl, HI, the extremely acidic mineral acids that will burn your skin if they come anywhere near you. H3O plus is a little bit less acidic than that around zero, and you can see I've provided on this slide some examples and sort of benchmarks to sort of calibrate yourself on pKa's. At the high end of the spectrum, even higher than the vinyl group I've shown here, are the alkanes, which have pKa's of around 50. Now, the span of this range from 15 to 50, remember that's on a logarithmic scale. That means that the acidity of alkanes is about 10 to the 65 times less than the acidity of the strongest mineral acids. 10 to the 65 is a number that we can barely even begin to fathom. It's it's tens of orders of magnitude greater than even the population of the Earth. And so this is really a staggering range that molecules can span in terms of acidity, from the least acidic, alkanes, alkenes, to the most acidic, the inorganic mineral acids with extremely stable uh, conjugate bases. And the last thing I'll say about pKa is that it's a very powerful tool so you may not realize it, but there are other processes in organic chemistry that resemble the process of acidity. And uh, we'll talk about this actually very soon when we talk about substitution. But this particular arrow, where we're taking the electrons in a bond and giving them to an atom, is essentially the process of acid dissociation um, sort of distilled to its essence. So we can replace H and A with different atoms carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, etc. But the essence of this arrow is still an acidic process, the accepting of electrons from a bond by an atom. Right? So we can talk about the leaving group ability of the A group. It's leaving with the electrons. It's accepting those and taking them away. We can talk about that in the context of acidity. And we find that leaving group ability and acidity are correlated. Or the lower the pKa of HA, the better a leaving group is A. So in the last few minutes here, I just wanted to review what we've learned about proton transfer, which is the first elementary step. Keep in mind that as we survey the elementary steps, you want to think about the mechanistic consequences and how you can predict whether an elementary step is reasonable to propose. In the case of proton transfer, it's all about the relative acidity of the two groups. So if HA is more acidic, has a lower pKa than HB, then we would favor this side of the equilibrium in which A is dissociated. If the opposite is true, 
then we would favor the dissociation of HB, and we would lie on this side of the equilibrium. And remember that acidity depends on the stability of charges, right? The stability of, con of cations and anions. This is extremely important. When you look at an acid-base equilibrium, you can almost tune out the neutral species 90% of the time and look only at the charged species and ask yourself which one is more stable than the other. Use the factors we've talked about to determine which cation is more stable than the other or which anion is more stable than the other. Next time, we'll take a look at the second elementary step I'd like to cover, the SN2 step, and this is the substitution of one group for another. It's actually rather analogous to um, the process of proton transfer, except instead of having a hydrogen being transferred or a proton, we're actually transferring an electrophilic carbon atom. So this is a great way to form carbon-carbon bonds, which is yet another really end game of organic chemistry, the methodical and uh, theoretically sound formation of carbon-carbon bonds. SN2 is one great way to do this, and we'll talk about all of the implications of SN2 in the next lesson. In particular, we'll bring back stereochemistry, and we'll see how the stereochemistry of the SN2 reaction is controlled by its molecular orbitals.